Are you the kind of person who takes this New Year thing seriously? Are you the kind of person who makes the resolution, or are you the kind of person who rejects the resolution? Or maybe somewhere in between. I, I, I don't know, but wherever you're at, the New Year is a good time to just consider what kind of person have we been and what kind of person will we be? And particularly as a Christian, it's a good time to think, what kind of Christian am I going to be in this new year? And how will I want God to show up? During Advent, which is the season that we just are getting out of, Advent was the season leading into the Christmas season, we started the Sermon on the Mount through a series called Bless Up. And as Christina said, each of these series for the next six months, they'll have a different name and a different graphic, but it'll all be marching through the same section in your Bible, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And as we uh, walked through this, uh, the, the very, very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we were talking about what it means to live a good life, because Jesus was giving his beatitudes, his blessings, and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the meek, and blessed are the merciful, and blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He pronounced these blessings, and what we said in that series was that the blessings were a way of talking about human flourishing. These are the people who live flourishing lives, and it was surprising. It was surprising. It's a, it's a shocking start to the Sermon on the Mount. And wh- whoever you, wh- however you desire uh, 2019 to go, or however you're forecasting 2019, that word is probably in connection to whatever we hope to do, that maybe our job would flourish, our life would flourish, our family would flourish in some way. And Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, is going to move from a pronouncement of flourishing, of blessing, to these, this interesting famous metaphor of salt and light. He's going to pronounce in a similar fashion who we are in him. He's not going to ask us to strive to be anything. He's not going to say, you better become salt and light. He's going to simply say this. We're just going to tackle one half of the metaphor this week, and then next week we'll talk about light. Look at this one verse, Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Now notice what he says. You are the salt of the earth. You don't have to try to be this. So in the new year and all the striving that you have, like Christina gave us that great pre-sermon, I loved it. You don't have to try to become this. So just sit back a little bit. This is Jesus instructing you what you already are in him if you follow him. You are the salt of the earth. But, he says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This metaphor, we're just going to look at it. What does it mean? We're going to turn it around. We're going to examine it. We're going to study it. How does, what does it mean to be salt as a Christian? And how does this maybe connect to how we could forecast 2019? Salt, I want to give three angles to the metaphor, three angles to the metaphor of salt for us to kind of understand and reflect upon today. The first you may not know, because salt is used differently today than it was in Jesus' time, but the first kind of metaphor that, that salt brings us into is this idea that salt preserves Salt was a preservative in Jesus' day. He, he, he would have known it, and his followers and his listeners would have known it to be something that would keep meat, particularly, uh, to last a long time. Uh, I don't know if you have ever thought about this before, but there were no refrigerators back then. There was no Sears or Best Buy where you could go purchase a device that would keep your items cold and prolong the life. Preserving is simply extending quality over time by holding in the good and keeping out the bad, right? And so salt actually was ground back in the day. It was, it was, it was packed into meat so that the meat would stay preserved. In other words, keeping out the bacteria, keeping out any type of insect or anything like that, right? That would uh, uh, contaminate the meat. It would keep out the bad and it would hold in the good. And Jesus, when he said, you are the salt of the earth, his his Followers would have thought about this as a preservative, meaning that Christians, that people who claim the name of Christ will act like salt. Bacteria is out so that nutrients are in. This means Christians will live in a preservative way, where they will hold fast and not be swayed by the culture and swayed by the times, and they will push back against the things that are not of God and keep out certain things to extend the quality of the spaces they live in. 
They'll also use their preserving nature to hold in the good. Christians will live respectfully, but not cave in to the pressures of society. We don't allow the bacteria to destroy what is good. Nor do we just let things go because, quote-unquote, oh, that's just the way things are. You'll hear this a lot. That's just how things go. Christians are skeptical of that phrase. They don't always think that that phrase is helpful or good because just because the way things are does not think, mean that it's the way things should be, the way things ought to be. And so as Christians, we preserve. The second one you're probably more f- familiar with is that salt flavors. What does it mean to be flavorful, to bring unexpected quality and volume to an otherwise unremarkable scene? You've all tasted food that needed more salt. You've also tasted food that was oversalted, but you've also known salt, and when you, when you bite into it, it, it's unmistakable. You know its presence when you eat food. And salt is given to bland food to flavor it. And it was used in Jesus' day for cooking as well as it's used today. And so, what are the unremarkable scenes that you inhabit today? What I mean is the scenes and spaces where the world considers them unspiritual or considers them worthless. Jesus says you will bring unexpected quality and volume to those unremarkable places that the world sees as useless. The world's going to see homeless people. They're going to call them that and just see homeless people, but we're going to see image bearers. The world's going to see annoying children. We're going to see gifts. The world will see hopelessness when we see hope. The world's going to see elderly people and consider them somewhat useless. We're going to see them as wise. The world's going to see a family as kind of a boring way to settle down, quote unquote. We're going to see endless possibilities. Likewise, the world will see a life unfulfilled by sex and maybe single for a long time. And they'll wonder, how can you live a life that's fulfilling and not not have any sexual encounters? And we're going to see the beauty of dedicating to Jesus for a long period of time. These are previously unremarkable scenes. The world's going to notice maybe a lack of travel or culture in your life. We're going to see rootedness as a gift. Staying in one place over a long period of time is going to be a gift. You see, salt flavors, and likewise, the Christian is going to flavor the scenes she or he inhabits. It's going to bring a a sense of quality and volume that was not previously there. See, the world's going to see unremarkable scenes. They're going to just call it a day job. They're just going to call it work. They're just going to call it technology. But you're going to see something different because of the eyes and the mind that Christ has given you for the world through this pronouncement on your life. Salt flavors, salt preserves. But, but very, very lastly, salt, it disappears. Salt is hidden in plain sight. And this is what I want us to focus on for our time together. It's to kind of take all of these together and consider how salt is both unmistakable but also invisible. You see, to be a salt like Christian is to be hidden in plain sight. You've all, like I said, taken a bite of something and and sensed the presence of salt immediately, but you never saw it. Likewise, that's why it's sometimes difficult to cook with because when you're throwing it onto something, you can't see how much is on there, right? You put salt and pepper onto something, you know how much pepper's on there, but you're like, did I put enough salt on here? It always requires a taste because salt is hidden in plain sight. Likewise, the Christian is to be the same. Salt's presence is unmistakable, but it's invisible. And likewise, a Christian's presence in this world, it will be unmistakable, but somewhat hidden. Let me explain what I mean by using two metaphors that will probably offend two different camps or whatever. (laughs) Um, So hang with me on this. I I pitched this to the teaching, teaching team and they laughed at it, okay? I think Christians tend to be either unmistakable or invisible, but never both. In other words, they're either in plain sight or they're hidden, but they're never hidden in plain sight. Here's what I mean. Um, God bless you who do CrossFit, but... (laughs) New year, new joke to offend people. Okay. Um, 
There's, a, there's an old joke about, about CrossFit. I didn't make it up, so I'm just reporting it. You know, like, how do you know your friend does CrossFit? Don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, <laughs> and that's the kind of Christian that's, like, unmistakable. Doesn't want to be invisible. Doesn't want to be hidden. It's kind of like, how do you know your friend's a Christian? Oh, don't worry, they'll have the talk with you, you know. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you know? First question out of the gate, it's like, okay, we've just been at coffee for 10 minutes. <laughs> On a more serious note, we have Christians that pronounce things through signs and lack relationships with people, right? Unmistakable Christians that are a little overly salted, shall we say? <laughs> or you have the Christian that is invisible. This one I think is more common. This one is like, um, if there's anyone here who plays Dungeons and Dragons, it's kind of like when you find out your friend plays D&D. You like go to drop something off, you know, and you open the door and there's like a whole world set up in there and they're wearing hats and the lighting's down and you're like, hey bro, I just can't, you left your jacket. What's going on in there? They're like, nothing, you know. Now, to the rare person who is both a CrossFitter and plays Dungeons and Dragons, I assume I may never see you again. Um, God bless you. I'm just banking on that person not existing. Um, but <laughs> the world is a surprising place in 2019. No, but like Christians can act that way, like their faith is their little secret that they have with their friends. And like if you were to ever have it found out, you'd be like, shoot, right? We've talked about this a lot in the Silicon Valley. My, my small group talks about this a lot. That actually in the Silicon Valley, this becomes very difficult to, to almost like expose yourself as a Christian. Like, oh, sorry, this is who I am. I think this is a lot more the way my generation swings. It's to this invisible faith that lacks any type of backbone or even confidence in its message. And so that Christian is radically undersalted, Right? The truth is we do not need to be obnoxiously forward or ridiculously reclusive. We must be hidden in plain sight. You can't see us like salt, but you're certain we're there. Hidden, not secretive, not withheld. Because without it, Jesus says, the world will lose its flavor and preservation. Without the salt Christians the kingdom will lose its flavor. Jesus used these other metaphors that are connected to this metaphor of salt, being hidden in plain sight as a Christian. He talked about his kingdom, which, which is all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. As we march through this over the next six months, you're going to understand way more about this thing he calls the kingdom. And in the rest of the Gospels, as you read in your Gospel reading plan, you're going to hear Jesus talk uh, endlessly about the kingdom. And he's going to use all these metaphors and in his metaphors is the same principle that his kingdom will be hidden in plain sight. He'll tell you flat out in Luke, he says, that you're not going to be able to say, hey, look, there's the kingdom, or it's right here. He says, in, in, in other words, the, he says, actually, the kingdom is in your midst, he says. It, it's hidden in plain sight. He gives these metaphors, seeds, leaven, treasure, pearls. Notice all of these. Seeds are buried beneath the ground. Leaven, hidden within a lump. You never know that it's there until the bread rises. You never know the seed is there until it sprouts. Treasure hidden beneath the surface. Think about those who uh, have the hobby of using a metal detector to find uh, precious metals. It's, it, people, people find ridiculous things that are hidden in plain sight. Treasure just beneath the ground, hidden in plain sight. He talks about the kingdom to be like a pearl. Where is a pearl? It's in a shell. You see, God's kingdom, the things that matter to him, are hidden in plain sight, just like his people. His people are just beneath the surface. That's why Jesus' hope for us in John 17, verses 14 through 19, he says that he prays that his disciples would be, this kind of mysterious phrase, in the world, but not of the world. That you would have a deep connection within the world, but be nothing like it. Likewise, the seed is not the soil. The treasure is not the ground. The leaven is not the lump right? The pearl is not the shell. All are distinct yet hidden within an environment. 
but they participate with that environment in a special and unique way. To be a Christian is to dedicate your life to a kind of beautiful obscurity. We live in a world of fame. We live in a world of profile-making, crowdfunding influencers. And we humans build an idol. And in the 21st century, it's as if we've built a a new idol, which is us. (laughs) We've constructed and concocted through social media primarily a presentation of us that we desire other people to celebrate. So Americans seek fame, and here's what I mean by fame. Because a lot of you go, fame, I don't want to be famous, I hate the spotlight. I'm not like a person who gets on a stage, I don't want to be that kind of person. But all fame is, is the condition of being known or celebrated based off of something you've done. And all of us desire this. All of us within us have the condition of desiring to be noticed and known, celebrated based off of something we have done. But the gospel is in contradiction to this. The gospel says you are celebrated not for what you will do, but for what Christ has done. Therefore, you do not need to parade your Christianity around, nor should you hide it. There should be within you a tension There should be within you a struggle of how to live as a Christian. The gospel says you're not celebrated for what you're known, uh, for what you will be known for, but who has known you in Christ. And this allows us to be obscure. Teilhard de Chardin was a French philosopher and Jesuit priest. Every Jesuit, I I grew up with them. Every Jesuit kind of has a side gig. They like always have something cool going on. They're like a poet or a musician or a mathematician. He was a paleontologist. He, uh, an interesting hobby. He, 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 was, he was interested in, in things beneath the surface. He wrote reflections on this. He was never famous through his whole life, but his writings were discovered after his death. And he says this in one of his diaries. He says, I discovered that there could be a deep satisfaction in working in obscurity, like leaven or a microbe. In some way, it seems to me you become more intimately a part of the world. Christianity offers a life, quote-unquote, in Christ. To be somewhat unknown because you're known by God. To be inconspicuous because you stand out in the eyes of God as his creation. You do not have a need for people to know where you stand because you know where you stand under Christ. You don't need recognition from people to, quote-unquote, get you because God has you. And so your freedom becomes unbelievably unrestrained. Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 3, just look at this verse for a while. For you have died. Okay? Just think on that for a little bit. You, all of who you are, yourself, your interests, your desires, you have died. And your life, all of who you are, is hidden with God. Christ in God. It's pulled behind a curtain. It's protected. It's preserved. Just like salt hidden with plain, in plain sight. This means the kingdom of God and you as a Christian are always hidden within an environment, not excavated out of an environment. Right? The leaven's within the bread, the seed is in the soil. All those things, as I said, They have a direct contact and even participation with the elements surrounding them. Spirituality, this is not to say this verse that you're hidden with Christ. It's not to say that your faith is sterile, that your faith is removed from all destructive elements like some kind of dentist's office. No, what what your faith is, is hidden in Christ in the world. You're placed in the environment Spirituality is not sterile. It's filthy. It's messy. You don't need to, though, find an environment, right? Notice Jesus again. He says, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, where, is your, uh, where has your salt been sprinkled? Wherever, you've been, wherever God has put you. He says, you are it. You're not, you see, Christians sometimes think we're the salt and we have to go like find some meat to flavor or like we have to go find it. It's like, no, 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 God has you there for some reason. He's got you in a spot and wherever you are, you're the salt. No striving, no trying. You are it. Jesus will always teach us in a way where we are to live as if we already are. 
you don't need to find it. You have the environment. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and we'll live within the environments God has given us. We're going to go to work. We're going to drop off the kids at school. We're going to attend to family members that are sick. We're going to go to church. We're going to study in college libraries, intimately a part of the world and yet distinct because the way we live in the world will be unique, flavorful, transcendent, dripping with eternity. This might help us understand Jesus' other teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. Later on, we're going to study a passage in Matthew 6 where Jesus talks about generosity, prayer, and fasting, back to back to back in Matthew 6. And in these three teachings, generosity, prayer, and fasting, he says the same line three different times in Matthew 6, 4, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 18. He says this line, Your Father, who sees in secret, who sees in secret, will reward you. Because he teaches generosity in a strange way. He says, nobody needs to know what you give because you'll give hidden in plain sight, a salt of the earth. He says, when you pray, you don't have to go around the streets parading your prayers. He's like, why don't you just go into your room and shut the door and pray? Your father who sees you in secret will reward you. When you fast, nobody needs to know. You'll be hidden in plain sight because your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Understanding our lives as salt helps us understand Jesus' other teachings that he's calling us to not live a life invisible, but also not to just live a life that's unmistakable, but to live a life that's both unmistakable yet invisible. I love uh, this, this the, one of my favorite illustrations for this is the life of a man named Henry Nowen. Nowen was a Catholic priest and theologian. He had re- reached the heights of academia. He was a professor at Yale Divinity School. Before that, he was a visiting press professor at Notre Dame. He had the highest success you could have in theological academia. During his time at Yale, he visited a small community caring for the disabled called Daybreak. He went on almost like a short-term mission trip there. And there, Nowen's vocation, it was completely transformed. It was upended. His idea of academia changed in a world of like ivy towers and best-selling books, he had realized he had missed the kingdom of God. This is an old man who had seasonedly studied the scriptures. When he met the poor and the disabled, he found God all over again, years after his ordination. He resigned his professorship at Yale and spent the last years of his ministry among this community called Daybreak, small group of disabled adults, and he was their pastor until he died. Now in reflections on leadership, it was published in 1989 under the title In the Name of Jesus, little book. In the book, he urges pastors and lay people, but it's predominantly towards pastors, to move away from pursuing relevance, what he calls relevance, moving away from relevance to prayer, away from popularity to ministry. And he saw in both the careers of lay people and in in pastors what he called, quote, a deep current of despair running beneath, beneath all this fame and success. Things looked good on the surface, but we were rotting underneath. You see, the salt had lost its saltiness. It was just religious performance to Henry Nouwen. It wasn't true gospel ministry. There was no taste. There was no flavor. There was no preservation. Things were rotting. He he writes this. While efficiency and control are the great aspirations of our society, we could add the Silicon Valley there, control, efficiency, Silicon Valley, the feelings of emptiness and depression and a deep sense of uselessness fill the hearts of millions of people in our success-oriented world. It's because we know, we know that there's, there's, there's a move of the kingdom happening. We just can't see it. And because there's something remarkable happening, hidden in plain sight, but like a person with a metal detector, we can't find it. And we're lost. And so we keep pursuing this efficiency and wealth and money and fame and success and power. And as we're looking and as we're searching, the deep current of despair is welling up beneath us. That's what the Silicon Valley has before it right now. And the gospel is calling us to look where we would never expect, away from the center, 
away from the epicenter of what Americans call their culture and life and look to the margins and look to the hidden places. It actually reminds me of the biblical book of Ruth. Have you read the book of Ruth? It's just four chapters long. If you haven't done it, throw it into the reading plan this week. Four chapters, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. The book of Ruth is sandwiched in between the two most violent and chaotic books of your Old Testament. It's sandwiched in a time of judges and kings, sin, rebellion, sexual immorality, power struggles, politicking. And Ruth is this little sweet story placed in the middle of it of this little immigrant widow from Moab who comes to marry a man in the suburbs of Jerusalem, out in the rural landscape, this man named Boaz. They meet, they fall in love, they live happily forever after, ever after. And you go, why is this story in my Bible? I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but like a book before, like people are getting their heads chopped off and the book after they're killing their children. Why is this sweet little book in the middle? It's because it's only until the end of the book that you realize why you're reading it. It's because it takes place away from the hustle and bustle of uh, Israel's economy and government. And at the very end, we learn, shockingly, that Boaz and Ruth are the parents to a man named Obed. Obed was the father of a man named Jesse. Jesse was the father of a king named David. And then you realize... This is the line of the Messiah. Shockingly, you realize the profound message. While violence and corruption haunts the center of Israel's life in Jerusalem, it's out on the margins on the farmland that God is furthering his redemptive purposes through an immigrant widow and her new husband. Hidden in plain sight. That God all of a sudden is doing what he always said he would do in the most surprising way. It's not happening through judges. It's not happening through kings. It's not happening through politics. It's happening through an immigrant widow. Christians have the imagination to understand that not everything we see is everything that's happening. It's certainly unsettling to see our current cultural and political moment right now in America, to read the news, to scan social media feeds, but as Christians, we know the great secret of the universe that what happens at the center is not all that's happening. God might be more active in the homeless encampment than the White House. God might be more active in an elderly retirement community than the halls of the Congress and the Senate. He certainly was telling us something when Jesus was born in a stable, far away from any royal court. Yeah, God's action in history, it actually wasn't to raise up a king, an emperor, not even a priest. God's activity in history was to come as a baby, born in a stable, in a manger, in a town called Bethlehem, not even in the center of where everything was happening. Actually, arguably, the same space in the same area Ruth met Boaz. That's why Isaiah prophesied this about Jesus in Isaiah 53 too. He said, he, Jesus had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. No, God chose the foolish, the hidden, the obscure. God chose Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. He chose a barn, not a temple or a royal court. God chose teenagers, not adults. He chose the common, the everyday, the noticeable, all to say that he came among us like the salt. He tells us we are. He came hidden in plain sight. And so God's work, his ministry in your life will be the same way. You will be doing ministry, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus in unremarkable places. In the name of Jesus, you'll just show up to work. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, you're gonna be slow to speak. In the name of Jesus, you won't need the last word. In the name of Jesus, you don't need to cut any corners with your relationships. In the name of Jesus, you can commit to forgiveness to those that have wronged you. In the name of Jesus, you can commit to the place God has put you because that's the salt you are on the earth place you've been given. That's just where you are. We're going to reject the lie that the grass is greener somewhere else because we know God has placed us as salt there. That's why Paul writes in Colossians 4 verse 5, he says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders and make the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, there's the metaphor again, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Memorize this verse this year. 
Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. God in Christ has given you this wisdom to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus just tells you, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, that's his phrase, you will see the kingdom of God. And so let me just close with some questions for you to reflect on. One, where, like salt, is God leading you to disappear into beautiful obscurity? Where have you been too forward, too brash, overly dramatic, clear to the point of insult? Where where do you need to be hidden? Where, like salt, though, is God leading you to be a preserving agent? Maybe you've fallen sway to culture. You've begun to sound like the internet and like your social media feed. Where have you leaned into the cultural moment too heavily? Where have you given away where you should have held fast? To preserve. And where, like salt, is God leading you to bring flavor? What stale, unremarkable places have you ignored and cast off as unspiritual that God is actually telling you you're the salt of the earth there? Where have you been complaining that people should quote unquote live this way or ought to do this? Where are you considering that people should do this or should do this when maybe it's time to take the responsibility of living in the place God has given you? Where, like salt, will you be hidden in plain sight? It's not going to be on some grand stage. It's probably going to be exactly what Jesus planned. It will be hidden in plain sight. Let me pray for you. And as we pray, let's consider the table. This is a beautiful ritual and routine for us every week where we remember we don't have to strive. We just receive the broken body of Jesus and the cup. And as you receive, receive your identity that he has given you, the salt of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, that you would give us a kind of heart that would know how to live the word that has been given to us. God, I pray for wisdom for 2019. God, I pray that our church would be filled with a kind of wisdom that surpasses the wisdom of this world. I pray that even it would be wisdom that looks foolish to the world, which your word says it will. That you, God, would help us live beautifully obscure, foolish lives in a crazy world. That you would Help us dedicate to the hidden, unremarkable places. God, where are those places? Give us the eyes to see. Give us the ears to hear. And Lord, as we receive your bread and your cup this morning, this beautiful ritual of coming before and simply receiving in a world that's trying to take, 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 God, I pray that as we receive, Lord, you would speak over this congregation and this people, Lord, that we are your children, we are beloved. And so, God, help us now as... As we lean in and worship you, Lord, respond to us, come to us, we pray in Jesus' name.